Hello families, we're going to talk today about the MAP test. MAP stands for Measures of Academic Progress. We give this test in our district three times each year. We do this in order to have updated data to ensure that we're meeting the instructional needs of all students. So what is MAP? We're going to talk about that today and we're going to talk about how students are assessed. We're going to talk about what a RIT score is. And we're also going to talk about how the MAP assessment helps us measure growth. So first of all, the MAP assessment is computer adaptive. What does that mean? That means that when a student takes the test, they're first going to be presented with a grade level difficulty item. If he or she is able to answer that question correctly, the next one is going to be harder. If they're unable to answer it correctly, the next one is going to be easier. So each question that a student answers correctly will result in a more difficult item being presented. When a student answers questions incorrectly, the next item gets easier. So you can see that this pattern that is emerging, it's looking to find the point at which students are answering about 50% of the items correctly. Why is it doing this? It's doing this because it's looking for the point at which students are ready for instruction. If a student is able to answer items at this difficulty level correctly nearly every time, this is too easy for the student. If the student is never able to answer any of these items correctly, the difficulty level is too hard and the student is going to be frustrated. So if we can find that place at which students are able to answer about 50% of the items correctly, this is where the student is really ready for instruction and where a teacher uh, can pinpoint to help a student grow. Now imagine taking a test though, we've all taken assessments, imagine taking a test where you're only getting about half of the items right. This does not feel good. If you're a student, this does not feel good. In fact, it feels very frustrating. A student may actually be performing very, very well on the assessment and it's still not going to feel good because by design, students are unable to answer all of these questions correctly. So I would actually encourage you to share that with your child, let them know, do your best. This assessment is used to help teachers know where you're ready to learn. And so you're not gonna get all of the answers correct and that's fine. This assessment is aligned to Tennessee state standards. And there are three versions. There's a K through two version, a two through five version, and a six plus version. You'll notice that there's an overlap for second grade. In our district, we administer the grades two through five in second grade. The difference between these versions is that there is audio support built into the K through two version. This allows us to assess skills such as letter sounds and, and you know, things where audio is actually required to successfully assess the skill. And that's the version that we give in K through one. Now, I will say for parents of students who are in kindergarten and first grade, as students perform well on the assessment, the audio support diminishes. So it's very natural to think something has gone wrong with the test and you want to jump in and help the child because the test isn't working, but that is actually how the test is supposed to function. When the audio support is diminished, it's because it's trying to assess more difficult skills. So please try to resist the urge to help the child with the assessment as it's going to incorrectly identify where students are able to answer 50% of items correctly. It's then also going to give teachers incorrect information about where students are ready for instruction. So the MAP test results in a RIT score. What is a RIT score? The RIT score tells people where a student is ready for instruction today. So where a student is ready for instruction is determined by what he or she already knows, right? Like if you are trying to figure out where to teach a student a particular topic, you need to know what the student already understands. So let's pretend a student has a RIT score of 200. Underlying that RIT score is a pile of mastered content. In order to have a RIT score of 200, you need to know this much stuff in our example. A RIT score is a RIT score is a RIT score. It doesn't matter what grade you're in. So if we had a second grader who has a RIT score of 200, this is her pile of mastered content. Likewise, if we had an eighth grader with a RIT score of 200, this would be his pile of mastered content. So a RIT score of 200 from a second grader and an eighth grader means that these two students have about the same pile of mastered content, okay? So these two students though, we know a second grader and an eighth grader who know about the same amount of math, these are very different students. 
So how can we begin to contextualize this? How can we begin to make sense of how these students are different? MAP has national norms. If a second grader has a RIT score of 200 and has this pile of mastered content, she may be down here at the 95th percentile, which means she is outperforming 95% of her peers. An eighth grader with a RIT score of 200, however, is down here at around the 13th percentile. So this means that he is only outperforming about 13% of his peers. So we know this because MAP has status norms. So in this example, we have two students who have the same RIT score with very different national percentiles. What if instead we wanted our example to have two students who were both at the 95th percentile? Well, in this example, our second grader would have a RIT score of 200, and this would be her pile of mastered content. Our eighth grader, however, would have to have a RIT score of 243 and have a much larger pile of mastered content in order to be at the 95th percentile. Again, we know these percentiles because MAP has status norms. Teachers do not have to do this. Uh, th this data is presented to them in the reports in our um, MAP website. But to show you how this works, there are norms tables. And basically, you can take your second grader who is in the fall taking reading and go find that table, see that she got a 200, find the 200 and see that she's at the 95th percentile. Then when we want to look at our eighth grader, we have to get the table for eighth grade and find the 200 for the eighth grader, and that's where we see that it is at the 13th percentile. So again, these are status percentiles. So MAP produces a RIT score, and we can see what national percentile that RIT score is at for each student. In addition to status norms, MAP has growth norms. MAP can tell us is a child growing at a below average rate, an average rate, or an above average rate? And why does this matter? Well, above average growth is required to increase a status percentile. What do I mean by that? We'll take a look at an example. So again, above average growth is required to increase a status percentile. So here we can see a photo of my child when she was born. She was T90, a little, little tiny baby, 12th percentile for length. So as parents, we were trying to get her, you know, her weight and her length up. And so we're feeding her and taking care of her. And we take her back to the doctor at three months. And we're pretty pleased. She's grown a lot. You can see she's, she's bigger. Her legs and arms are longer. She looks heavier. Um, but she's still at the 12th percentile. So what happened? She clearly grew. Well, she grew at an average rate. She grew, but so did all of the other babies. Therefore, her status percentile stays the same. So we take her back at six months. You can see she's clearly grown. However, again, so did all the other babies. She's growing at an average rate, stays at the 12th percentile. We take her in at nine months and the same thing happens. She's still growing, but she's holding steady at the 12th percentile. Same thing for one year and two years and three years. You can see she's definitely growing. She's absolutely growing, but she's holding steady at the 12th percentile because she's experiencing average growth. But then we had a burst of above average growth, and I do mean really above average growth, like call the pediatrician, is this okay? Is there a concern? Everything was fine as it turns out. She was just growing really, really fast, such that now what we have is a child who's actually at the 60th percentile, slightly above average for height. So it was not until she experienced above average growth that she changed her status percentile. The same is true of the MAP assessment. If a child needs to increase his or her status percentile, then above average growth would be required. If a child experiences below average growth, they're going to lose ground in their status percentile. So with these status norms and growth norms that MAP has, we can see what the proficiency projection will be. The status norms, the percentile, these are what will become the proficiency projection. So if a student is not projected to be on track or mastered when he or she takes 10 ready, you know that above average growth is going to have to happen in order for the child to reach on track or mastered by the time they take 10 ready. And then the growth norms are what give us a window into TVOS. So next, I'd like to shift gears and show you a student profile report. 
So this is a student profile report found in the MAP site after a student completes the assessment. Just so that you know, this is not real student data. This is a report pulled out of a demonstration website, so I'm not showing real student data here. So what you will see, that the, the teacher is able to see for each subject that the student takes the test, what the student's RIT score is, how long they spent on the test, and all of that sort of data. Um, in our district, we only give the math assessment and the reading assessment, so we would not have language usage and science, just math and reading. So for example, this student took the assessment, and in math, the student scored um, at the 16th percentile with their RIT score of 191. That is uh, information that is useful, but what is far more useful is understanding how this RIT score shows what a student is ready for instruction on. So in addition to seeing the RIT score and the achievement level, the national percentile, the teacher can expand the instructional areas and see the standards on which students are ready for instruction. This can be viewed by Tennessee State Standards, and this is available for both subject areas in which we take the test. So you can see this student is at the 16th percentile in math. However, when we go to reading, we can see that the student is at the 83rd percentile. Once a student has more than one assessment, the teacher is also able to monitor growth rates to make sure that the student is not losing ground or is accelerating as needed. So this student uh, is at the 83rd percentile in reading, but is also growing at at least an average rate. 52nd percentile. This again can be expanded to show the standards for which a student is ready for instruction. And this is why students might get items that are really, really difficult in advanced grade levels even, because some students have mastery of grade level standards um, and beyond. And then some students may have lower grade level standards showing. So this is a student, by the way, who appears to be in fourth grade and is at the 83rd percentile for achievement. So this is a high achieving student. However, when we look at where the student is ready for instruction, you'll notice that there are actually some standards. This is a third grade standard that the student is ready for instruction on. So this is an area where a student could benefit from some remediation. So, in this way, the teacher can use the RIT score information to understand where students are ready for instruction. Uh, and just as an ex a further example, in math, you'll see that the student is at the 16th percentile. The student is growing at an above average rate, at the 80th percentile. So the teacher really needs to continue with what the teacher is doing because it is working. The child is actually showing growth and making progress. With continued growth, the student's national percentile will, will increase, and the student's likelihood of becoming proficient on 10 Ready will also increase. We very much appreciate you taking the time to come and learn more about the MAP assessment and how it functions, and the kind of data that it provides for teachers. We hope it's been helpful, um, and we also appreciate all of the effort and work that you're putting in to help the administration be successful as we are learning remotely. We appreciate all that you do to support your children. And again, I just want to remind you, you know, students need your help with logging into the team site. They need your help with logging into the test maybe, but please be sure to not help them with the actual test content. If you think there's an issue with how the test is behaving, please reach out to your child's school. You don't want to help with the content though, because it will give teachers incorrect information about where students are ready for instruction. And again, remember, as an, answer, as an item is answered correctly, the next one is going to be harder, and it's going to continue to get harder and harder and harder. So you really need the child to demonstrate what he or she knows. And also remember, this assessment is not used for a grade, and this year it's not being used for academic magnet qualification purposes either. So it's really important to encourage your child to do his or her best work. Remind him or her it's not possible to answer all of these questions correctly. Just do your best, show what you know, and show your teacher what you're ready to learn next. Thanks again for taking the time to learn more about MAP. If you have additional questions, please reach out to your child's school and we'll be sure to get you the information that you need. Thank you.